towards my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, our strength and our redeemer. It was a long, hot summer, and the weeds were growing wild. Stuck inside with two little girls, my mother had had enough of it. She sent my sister and I outside with an offer. A penny a week. If you clear that messy garden. A hundred weeds for a dollar in time to finish that sewing project or start dinner. To her, it was a wise and prudent bargain. What she didn't count on was the tenacity of two little girls. What we were after, I'm not sure. I don't remember, for my sister was probably enough money to buy something at the local store. And for me, it was probably the challenge. The gauntlet thrown down, me against the weeds. A competition. I will beat those weeds and my sister. I wish I could remember it now. Was it a thousand weeds and ten dollars? Five hundred weeds and five dollars? Details fade, but the story is legend among my family. I can still imagine this big pile of weeds gathered on the side of our garden. My sister and I counting them one by one as my mother looked on with this surprised face. But true to herself, she held her to her bargain and we pocketed our new money. Surely we collected some good plants along with those weeds. But she didn't reprimand us. Yet that was the last time she made that kind of bargain. Jesus says in parable, let them grow together. In this parable, he compares the kingdom of heaven like a field sown with good seed. But while everybody is sleeping, an enemy sows among weeds among the wheat. Jesus teaches, do not go out and gather the weeds, for in doing so, you might pull up some good seed might pull up the wheat, the wheat, that bread of life. Let both of them grow together. And when the harvest time comes, the reaper, the harvester, will gather the wheat in the barn and burn the wheat. Or as Matthew explains in more graphic images, the Son of Man will send his angels to collect the good seeds and the weeds we put in the furnace of fire. Either way you look at it, the one identified with God, the Son of Man. God, not the workers, not the children, are making the decisions about sorting, about collecting, and about burning. And it happens in God's own good time. This is a hard lesson to grasp. How to learn to live with the wheat and the enemy's weeds standing side by side, sharing the same soil, the same water, the same sunshine. Sometimes we just want to clear out those weeds with a weed whacker, or even worse, with Roundup. My nemesis. This parable cannot just be saying, sit idle while evil looms around us. Wouldn't that kind of directive lead us to a kind of dystopia like the Hunger Games or that show where the Nazis won the war? How does God keep the weeds from taking over before the time of the harvest? And what does the wheat, how does the wheat live among the weeds without being choked out? What does it look like for us today? What does it look like for us today to live among the weeds? What are those weeds, anyway? What are the weeds? 
start with that question. In short, they are those things we'd rather not have in our gardens. Those things that distract us from the growth and life that God is cultivating, cultivating in us and cultivating in the world. But before we are too quick to say, wheat is good and weeds are all bad, who hasn't seen some beauty in a dandelion, a roaming, a wisteria, or even a simple four-leaf clover? Is there goodness? Is there beauty in the weeds? Is there goodness? Is there beauty in the suffering, in the loss, in those we disagree with? While we may not see these things as good or having the potential for goodness, God must. That is why the harvesting is left to God and not to us. To say that a bad seed always is a bad seed is to say that evil wins. To say that something begins is a and must remain a weed forever is to say that the enemy is more powerful than God, that evil is more powerful than God. That is precisely what Jesus' life, death, and resurrection does not say. Evil and death do not win in the end. They do not choke out goodness then, now, and in the age to come. What about today? What about those weeds in our own lives, those things we would rather not have in our garden? What about those things that detract us from life, from growth, from the promise that God has been cultivating in us? we could all come up with our own individual list. But as we do so, let us not forget the parable. Separating and judging is God's work. It is not our own. But with that, I say it is worth taking some time to look at those things. Remember from the parable, it was when everybody was sleeping when the enemy sowed the weeds among the wheat. When we open our eyes, we have a better chance of distinguishing the weeds in our life from the wheat in our life. Distinguishing those things that bring true life, the bread of life, bring love in some imitation or strength. I have to say, I have been recently very distracted by the weed of deceit. How many times I have wanted to take a machete and cut through that weed of deceit that has been lingering in our world. Deceit kills. Like in the case of the young man who died after going to a COVID-19 party because he thought the whole thing was a hoax. This hit me a little bit personally this week because I know some of the doctors down in South Texas on the border who are working <laughs> day and night dealing with this disease. It is no hoax. At all times, disease and deceit can be super weeds. Deceit sparks those other weeds of injustice, infidelity, oppression, racism, and despair say that the weed of the seed was probably planted in that original garden with the whole apple story. It's easy for deceit to make a home in our gardens. Quite frankly, some fruits are just too painful to bear. I think God understands that. Yet Jesus that Son of God is always out unmasking the devil and demons, calling them by name and disarming them. Are we to continue 
this work of unmasking, of disarming? How can we help those good seeds to grow among all those weeds? How is God keeping the weeds from taking over until the time of harvest? Here's where I'd like to turn our attention to Paul's letter to the Romans. How, Paul teaches, how? Paul says to live by the gift. Live by the gift and power of the Holy Spirit. Live as we are adopted children of God. To live as children of God by the gift of the Spirit is to rest in the promise of the sower of good seed. Not to be overcome by the suffering, overcome by the fear overcome by the evil of our present time. Like a mother birthing a child, the pain and suffering last for a moment. It is fleeting compared to the joy to come. Try, try to think of how I can describe this living by the Spirit, and I came up with this idea from the Gospel of hopeful imagination. To live by the Spirit is to live with a hopeful imagination. As Paul writes, for in hope we are saved. Now hope that is seen is not hope. For who hopes for what is seen? But if we hope for what we do not see, we wait for it with patience. Hope does not lie in what was. It does not try to replicate the past. If we have seen it, it is not something hoped for. Hope is reserved for something prospective, something better than what has been, something more than we can imagine. Like how a little known Jewish man and teacher is revealed as Christ. How revolutionaries opposed an empire a nation, how everyday people care every day for the hungry, the orphan, the sick, the refugee, the dying. Hopeful imagination. Hoping for what we do not yet see takes patience. We wait for it with patience, Paul says. Waiting in this way is not passive patience. It is an active waiting. The earliest disciples waited for the return of the Messiah while they were spreading the gospel and making new disciples. Paul is waiting by writing letters, telling his conversion story, and trying to hold desperate churches together. Maybe for us this waiting is simply doing one little bit of good. One little bit time that we are Waiting is built into nature. I'm amazed how long it takes some trees to bear fruit. For a pear, it's four to six years. For sweet cherries, even longer. The good fruit we pray for. An end to a pandemic. Justice and peace in this nation. Healing in our hearts and homes. And reverence for creation about years, decades, centuries, even millennia. Some people have spent their whole time pushing against the weeds. It takes a process. It takes a lot of stops and starts and mistakes along the way. And yet we keep praying. We keep praying like we'll, what we will do in a minute when we pray those prayers of like pulling a thousand beads on a hot Texas day. Waiting with patience, living with hopeful imagination, has within it an energy, a kind of energy that is beyond simple optimism. It's a kind of restlessness. It's a longing, a longing for fulfillment of what has already begun in us. It is a longing for continuation and completion 
completion of what we have glimpsed as children of God. So today, as these weeds continue to grow all around us, let us receive the gift of the Spirit. Receive it openly, freely, without fear. Following where God is leading us. Leading us to stand among the weeds. Pushing against them along God's way of love.